So as I say, why are we here? <coughs> According to the <coughs> excuse me, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, about 800 Australian children were in prison on an average day as at June 2020 when they did this research. Almost four in five of them, that is 78% of young people in detention on average that night were unsentenced. That is, they were on, uh, th they were waiting to be dealt with. Their matter, they had not been sentenced to anything. And of course, many of them would not be sentenced to a longer term than they spent uh, on bail, uh, not on bail actually, on remand. <clears throat> Over half of all the young people in detention on average were Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. Indigenous people make up 6% of the Australian population aged 10 to 17. The young Indigenous Australians aged 10 to 17 were 26 times as likely as young non-Indigenous Australians to be in detention. A report by the Justice Reform Institute shows Queensland detains the highest number of youth offenders in the country with 90% of children in custody waiting for their cases to be resolved. That's higher than the national average. Queensland now imprisons the highest number of children Australian-wide, with the youth prison population increasing by 27% over the past seven years. One in three adults entering prison report living with a disability. There is a good reason to think, according to the Justice Reform Institute, that a high proportion of children in the youth justice system have neurodevelopment impairments. By contrast, in Scotland in 2021-2022, there were 14 down from, 20, 20, down from 22 uh, young children, young people in detention. And it's expected that this year, there will be zero. And are gangs roaming Glasgow's streets or doing bad things in the glens? Not at all. And yet, it is the Queensland government that is proposing not to follow Scotland, Scotland at all. It is proposing to double down on what it has been doing. According to Einstein, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. <clears throat> the purpose of this evening's discussion is to show that there are other ways of doing things which are not insane. That is, we can have less crime and young people being, being allowed to continue their lives in a fruitful and fashion rather than being locked up and of course learning how to do crime better being alienated from society which is a of course a net worse result so our first speaker this evening is mr keith hamburger keith was the director general of the queensland corrective services commission from 1986 to 1997 he contributed to three major inquiries into Queensland Corrections, as well as a review of the parole system. He was a member of the parole board and has studied corrections extensively in many countries, including Germany, Holland, England, Singapore, the USA and New Zealand. He is a member of the General Division of the Order of Australia for Public Service. Please welcome Keith. <clears throat> Sorry, just getting the technology right. Thank you very much, Michael, for the introduction, and thank you all for being here this evening. It's a very, very important topic, and uh, I'm sure Debbie and Catherine will uh, add, add a lot of value to the opening address that I will give. Th that uh, picture there is the Lost City on uh, Mount Tabor Station near Augafella. It's about 200,000 acres of land owned by the Bidjara 
people, traditional land, and um, there's about seven kilometres of sandstone cliffs there with art and a whole range of things, and it's a very sacred place for those people. I pay respect to uh, Artie Keelan Mailman and Artie Cheryl Lawton, who are the leaders in that particular community, and I've worked with them now since about 2016 on developing alternatives to imprisonment for First Nation adults, which basically, in spite of a lot of very, very hard work, it's got nowhere uh, with the Queensland government, sadly. <clears throat> and I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of, our, of the country and nations throughout Australia, recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community that was never ceded. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. What we have in Queensland at the moment is a complete disaster, a youth crime disaster. Of monument, It's a monumental failure of public administration. And it's assault upon the human rights of children and their families and communities. And it's an utter tragedy for innocent victims. It's a perfect storm, really. Um, it's got catastrophic circumstances in First Nations and other disadvantaged communities, combined with catastrophic failures in the Queensland criminal and social, social justice system. And what we've got is a human and social disaster of terrible proportions, ruining the life chances of children, costing enormous pain to the, to the tax, taxpayer, and a whole lot of money being wasted on demonstrably inappropriate responses. Beg your pardon? There's no silver lining, no. The great majority of child offenders, sorry, I've just got to bring this next slide up. Just As we all know, the great majority of child offenders come from very disadvantaged families and communities. They're impacted by poverty, many by severe mental health issues, FASD, neurodevelopmental impairment. And yet incomprehensibly, as Michael referred to, policymakers believe that 10 to 17 year old children should be kept in concrete cells in a non-therapeutic environment, far from family as punishment, under the ridiculous assumption that this punishment will rehabilitate severely damaged and mentally ill children. And that's that definition of sanity that insanity that Michael referred to. We've got 72% of children in juvenile detention centres are First Nations children. 90% when they get released come back to the detention within 12 months and 90% progress to adult prisons. And that statistic's been around since way back in the 90s when I worked in corrections. And yet the government is proposing more child prisons that have seen cost and apparently oblivious to the complete failure of this approach. And when I say have seen cost, the prison cell for a child or an adult costs a million dollars each to build. And that takes in all of the infrastructure that goes around the cells, etc. Up there is an example of a horrendous situation of the treatment of a child in detention, kept in solitary confinement, for at least 45 days, denied drinking water, spent some 22, year, 22 days straight, entirely in solitary confinement. And this case is just one of many that's happening. And in recent times, the courts have been uh, bringing these to the attention of the public and making very serious comments to the government about this sort of treatment. My view is very clear on this. No child should ever be placed and kept in solitary confinement. It's a breach of the child's human rights. It's cruel, it's an inhumane, and operationally it is totally unnecessary and it must never be used. Yet this child abuse is happening in Queensland and we should be marching in the streets and the government agencies should be ashamed that this is happening. There's just no need for it. Yet I see statements by the relevant minister from time to time that this is appropriate and needed and so forth, but I can tell you operationally it's not needed. So what we've got is in Queensland at the moment, the response to child crime is not founded in evidence or best practice. It criminalises children and ensures that 90% of children become adult criminals, contributes to innocent citizens being, citizens being murdered, 
and the solutions that have been available for years have been completely ignored by government and thus innocent lives have been lost. It's a complete failure in public administration and I believe there's justification for a Royal Commission. That's how bad it is. I've said to a couple of ministers I've spoken to in recent months that if they hoped they were watching the Robo Debt Royal Commission and seeing ministers in the witness box being grilled in that situation, and I can tell you if there's a Royal Commission in Queensland and this stuff, uh, there's a paper trail that we, the people I work with, have laid to the door from the Premier down where we've set out the sort of things I'm talking about tonight, but we've also offered them solutions and they've just ignored it. In the following slides that I'll go through, uh, I'll present a structure that I think uh, could change the way we operate at present. It's a framework for a structure. I'm not putting it up carved in stone and saying that this is totally the best way to go. And I'm sure that Debbie in particular from her lived experience will have a whole lot of thoughts about this. But I believe that if we look at this and work in co-creation in local communities to implement what I'm going to talk about uh, and refine it and improve it, that it will de deliver far better uh, outcomes than what we're getting at the moment. As I say there, it'll be locally owned and it'll be run by not-for-profit entities. And I'll go into that now in some detail. Big pun? No, not private. Group. So the architecture for reform that we need in Queensland, bipartisan political support. I was appointed as Director General back in 1988, and that was a result of the Kennedy, Kennedy Commission of Royal, uh, sorry, the Kennedy Royal Commission of Inquiry into the Queensland prison system, as it then was. And at that time, bipartisan support was achieved across the major political parties to change policy. And if you look at the changes that have occurred in Northern Europe over many years, coming starting after the Second World War, the warring political parties, if you like, in the Northern European countries decided that they had to agree on policy and then the opposition would criticise government on implementation if they felt the policy wasn't up to scratch. Or sorry, if the operations weren't up to scratch and weren't reflecting the policy. We've never been able to get uh, any uh, sensible cooperation between major parties here on policy because they're always looking at the next election and trying to argue against each other. But we do need that bipartisan political support and they need to look at the real evidence and come up with, with good policies that will work across the criminal and social justice systems. The Product, Queensland Productivity Commission in 2019 recommended an independent statutory justice reform office reporting to Parliament they didn't recommend via parliamentary committee, but I put that in here because we believe it should be via parliamentary committee to get that policy agreement across the board. What the justice, what the uh, productivity commission found, which we all know, is that all of the government departments working in the social and criminal justice systems work in silos. We have police, education, health, etc., youth justice, um, and of course, the problems we've got are place-based out in local communities where we've got. Uh, disadvantaged, poverty-stricken families, all sorts of issues, kids being suspended from school and not getting an education, all of that sort of stuff. But we've got these siloed approach by the departments to that. So we need an holistic place-based response. Productivity Commission identified that and said we need an independent statutory authority called a Justice Reform Office to get these agencies working together and report to Parliament on a holistic response to this problem. The government ignored that recommendation totally. That office needs a working party from relevant departments and outside independent people. And we need to then work with that to get this place-based response that I just mentioned. Now, this is, I put this, for, this forward as, a, as I said, a, a broad structure and needs a lot of work, but we keep seeing serious crimes committed by young people and we often see in the media that child was known to police. Now, what I'm saying is that this known to police thing, uh, we need to get hold of that child and that family early in the piece. And what they have in places like Northern Europe, for example, if I've witnessed, they have assessment centers. And so a child that's found wandering the street at two o'clock in the morning or is uh, disadvantaged in a terrible way, et cetera, 
at risk of crime or might have committed a crime are taken to, the, to an assessment centre where they get holistically assessed. And that takes some weeks and it involves talking to family, talking to educationalists, to health professionals, etc. And out of that, they develop a plan for that child, which is then taken to a, a magistrate. Now, everything I'm going to talk about now is outside of the criminal justice system. Children, in my view, should not be dealt with under criminal sanctions. And indeed, and I think it's still the case, uh, if you're convicted of a crime as a child, that's sealed when you become an adult and it's not used against you. I think that's correct in, in the justice system as it is. So why the hell are we putting these kids through uh, the criminal justice system anyway? So, so under the model I'm going to talk about is if there's no offence, the child might have just been out on the street for some other reason or whatever, um, but that child and the family are supported and the child gets back, goes back to the family. But if there is an offence committed, the child with this pathway plan that's developed with the input of all of the health and educationists and other professionals about the child's situation is taken before a magistrate. Now, not for a criminal sanction, and what I'm proposing here is four options for the magistrate. We do have, sadly, some very problematic, dangerous young people. Some, some children commit murder, sadly. Um, what we see at the moment, we saw it in the paper this morning and I've dashed off a letter to the editor about it, the government's now going to build more detention centres. They're planning an 80-bed centre at, to place adjacent to the Woodford High Security Male Prison. Um, disgraceful waste of public money. Anybody that's ever worked with problematic young people and all the literature experience says if you get more than six in a group, uh, you can't work, it doesn't work. So we need small facilities where we can give intensive treatment to these very serious problematic young people. And when I say facilities, I'm talking about large tracts of land, I'm talking about a therapeutic type residential building, I'm talking about proper education, uh, training, animal therapy, sport, recreation, whatever we've got to do in a, to get pro-social thoughts and so forth into these children and particularly that what the small centres allow is that you can locate them close to the child's family and community of interest. Remember, bear in mind, a lot of these young people are coming from First Nations communities and we take them hundreds and sometimes thousands of kilometres away from that community to bring them down here and put them in a jail. Um, and we think that's going to rehabilitate them. So it's very important if this facility is near the families, we can then work holistically with the families as well. And they will be involved in programs with the child and parenting support and whatever has to be done. So talking there about the, the category, the very high, high level, dangerous kids, six beds. We can still have very problematic children. I wouldn't go above 12 beds. Once again, small facilities. I think if you look at human history, we're, we're really incapable of running large institutions. If you take large schools, large hospitals, whatever, um, and certainly large prisons, they don't work, they're ineffective. They talk about economies of scale, but it gets to a point when you get to a certain stage where you just don't get effectiveness. And I've worked in large prisons, we're building 1,000 bed, 1,500 bed prisons. And let me tell you, uh, just look at the recidivism rates, they don't work. So what for children in particular, we need small therapeutic, intensive program based facilities, and that's what I'm proposing there. In a, then at the next level, and some of these children in these smaller facilities will graduate to this, or some might go straight there under the plan that the magistrate approves. Um, is a, as we have at the moment, unofficial kinship caring systems, particularly in the First Nations communities, where an aunt will take in additional children and try and look after them in addition to her own, etc. What we're proposing is a proper accredited training program for kinship carers. They will be paid a wage. They'll be paid money to make sure these children are well looked after, that they get to school, they get to sport, they get all the things that other kids get. And so that's where they will, will go. And then, or hopefully, the fourth level is some might just go straight back and be placed back with their family. So we just get rid of these large juvenile detention centres in some way, replace them with place space, small facilities that are intensive and therapeutic. If we had something like that, we would the courts, the court, the magistrate who places the child in whichever, what it's, whichever of those options will get regular reports on the child's progress. A level of supervision can be adjusted depending on behaviour. 
and the model includes holistic place-based community primary intervention services and strategies to deal with the drivers of the crime at the community level. And I'll come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> so some of the assumptions under that model, which as I say, require a lot more work to, to flesh it out and I'll be proposing some trials shortly. The secure assessment centres would be operated as I see it by a government department and it would include First Nations staff. The 24-7 super, supervised small therapeutic facilities for the high risk of very problematic children will be delivered by First Nations and other not-for-profit entities. Take up your point, it's not a private prison model at all. It's actually a restorative justice model. And so what the plan would be that they would have contracts from the government to look after these children. Um, the justice reinvestment comes into it because you mentioned private prisons. We've had, they've now been phased out in Queensland, but we've had them for years where they make a profit, which goes to shareholders. Under this model that I'm talking about, there would be a contract with government that included a surplus above the operational cost. And for if they, the, the KPIs are met, that surplus goes, gets reinvested back into the community where the children come from. So it's to, to actually do more pro-social outcomes. And as I said, the kinship caring system is a properly trained accredited carers with those surpluses being put back into the community. Sorry, I didn't move on to that slide. Right. So what that does, that phases out the ineffective, inhumane and costly youth detention centres. We've got at the moment, I think they're 250 and 300 bed centres. The Justice Reform Office and the Working Party will co-create three trials of that model that I've just talked about. And a business case for these could be with the cabinet within a few months if the government would just fire the starting gun. So uh, we've got, we've spoken to a lot of First Nations communities about this, and we've got about half a dozen that want to do this. Um, but we would like to start with three trials. One gets stuck into initially get the first business case up in consultation with the other next two, and then we phase very work very quickly towards that. I mean, this is not rocket science. They're not big facilities. They're quite. Uh, cost effective to build. And because we will be taking young people into that therapeutic environment, we, we will definitely see within a relatively short space of time an impact on the sort of street crime that we're, we're seeing at the moment. That so what I'm talking about is that what we're proposing is only part of the answer. It must be done in concert with initiatives to overcome disadvantage impacting on families and communities, which is the primary driver of child crime. So our, our approach to disadvantaged First Nations and other Australians has been founded in doing things to them or for them. But our reform model that I'm talking about here is based where we give agency to those disadvantaged communities, empowering them to overcome poverty and deliver services to improve the circumstances of family and children. I mentioned Bidger, uh, the Bidger ground be, land before with Keel and Mailman and Cheryl Lawton, and they have a whole raft of training and work opportunities out there for adult offenders. Uh, and we'd be looking at only having a small number, about 12 out there, and that's the sort of thing that can happen on these communities. We had a scheme in, in for adult corrections in when I was there with the Western Outreach Camp Scheme, which is still going, but not to the same extent. And the anecdotal evidence from that, where prisoners actually worked in the community and, and got skills and so forth, uh, the recidivism rate from that group was far lower than just turning them straight out of, out of prison. Yep. Just trying to line up that arrow, got it. So I mentioned earlier that the justice services will be delivered by First Nations and not-for-profit entities funded by service agreements. Uh, they would do, in addition to the justice services I've just mentioned, and we've talked to the local communities and I've talked to people like uh, Works and Housing in the government, that they, they will take over uh, and be involved in services such as child and family support, housing services, education services, a very effective uh, First Nations Silver Lining Foundation provider of uh, special education services. They would be a core provider of education to these facilities that I'm talking about and also to the community generally. 
There's opportunity for enterprise development in all of these communities. That slide I had at the very start of the, of the Lost City, major tourism opportunities there on that site uh, where children, can, uh, young people can get uh, job skills training and, and work and live there. So it's all part of a justice reinvestment solution and we've got a, quite a number of First Nations communities ready to go. Sorry. So I guess in conclusion that our Australian response to child crime and also to adult crime is broken. The ramifications are horrendous. Loss of life, children condemned to a life in the criminal justice system, poverty and disadvantage ignored, billions of dollars wasted on inhumane and ineffective jails, families and communities demonised. The Productivity Commission report talked about I think it's about three and a half billion is needed between now and 2025 just to, to keep up, uh, to reduce overcrowding in our jails. We're running at about 130% across our jails um, at the moment. And uh, there's three and a half billion there that need not be spent because if you look at adult offending, 60% uh, of adult offenders are in there for non-violent crimes and yet we're locking them up in high security cells and the average sentence length is 3.9 months but we keep building high security cells, just a farce. So we need multi-partisan agreement across the parliament to change the policy settings overseen by an all party parliamentary justice reform committee committed to the concept of restorative justice, justice reinvestment to drive the, this reform model. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. So our next speaker is, oh, here, there he is. It's Catherine Hayes, who is one of these lawyers who's uh, done the sort of thing that some of us want to do, which is to go from hanging out doing insurance law to uh, Oh, now I've just broken my glasses. That'll work. Um, anyway. <laughs> Amusing things happen today. So yes, so she's gone from uh, working for a Lloyd syndicate to uh, doing what she now does, youth, working at the Youth Advocacy Centre in Brisbane. So without any further ado, because I can't read the rest of my notes, <laughs> I'll uh, introduce Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'm the CEO of the Youth Advocacy Centre and like Michael said, I've only been in the sector for seven months. So you'll get my perspective in contrast to Debbie and Keith and they have an absolute depth of knowledge that I don't have. But what I've learned from my short time in the sector is that what's happening in Queensland at the moment is just astonishing. So the Youth Advocacy Centre, we're a small community legal centre and we act for young people that are in the youth justice system. And in addition, we have social workers and youth workers who provide a wraparound service to those young people. And the cases that we have had are eye-opening. It's one small boy who came into Yak's orbit a few months ago, a 13-year-old Aboriginal boy who lives under the Grey Street Bridge. And he is an absolutely beautiful boy, adorable, big brown eyes, good sense of humour, just an endearing, lovable kid. He's been living on the streets for about four months. He hasn't been in school for about six months. Um, he talks about smoking marijuana and meth, and I'm only hoping that he's exaggerating what he does, but he does that on a fairly regular basis. And at the moment, he's on bail for armed robbery. So that was, he went to a convenience store at West End with a Stanley knife and said, give me all your money, and then ran away when the man said he'd call the police. So he steals to eat. Um, his bail conditions are that he must go home, but he can't go home because his stepfather is abusive. So the new laws mean that it's now a crime for this little boy not to go home to the abusive stepfather. He has someone who has been failed by all of the adults in his life, and now he is failed by us as a community. He's still on the streets. There are a lot of organisations around him, but his life is now entrenched on the street. He has a street family. They go out and steal cars. That's what they do. That's their identity. That's how they belong in this group. 
it's a devastating story to just see him very slowly go on this path that is not going to have a good ending unless there's some kind of intervention that can happen. Another one of Yak's clients on the Sunshine Coast is a 15 year old boy who had a drug addicted mother and was not able to provide any kind of mothering whatsoever. His father was not around at all. He had mental health issues. I think his mother probably had mental health issues as well. One day he was walking across a bridge that had a railway track beneath it and he jumped off the bridge to end his life. On the way down, he um, was caught by the train electric lines. He suffered severe burns to a lot of his body, landed on the train tracks. The police came. They saw that a drug implement had been seared into his skin. They charged him with a possession of a drug implement and then they charged him with trespass because he was on Queensland Rail property. So there is no heart in that kind of treatment of these young people, these young people who have been failed. So by the time they get to this stage, they're a long way along a path that began a long time ago. So at the Youth Advocacy Centre, what we are trying to do is to intervene in these young people's lives as early as possible. But by the time they come to us, it's a really difficult thing to do. So we want to see a coherent approach by the government where youth justice, child safety, Department of Education and Queensland Health together work and provide a safety net for these kids from as early as possible. And that might be from birth or it might be from at first problems in school, problems in su suspension later on, because once the child has difficulty at school, once they are suspended from school, then that's another another obstacle to getting back onto a positive path. So any kind of early intervention where there is that cross department analysis of the child's needs and ascertaining whether they've got fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which is very difficult in Queensland because apparently there are only two practitioners who are able to make that diagnosis in Queensland. So we have by practitioners reports by people just observing these young people's conduct, a massive overrepresentation of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in the youth kids in the youth justice system but we're not able to properly assess that or treat that because of the massive underrepresentation of skilled practitioners so first of all people can't get treat assessed and then can't get treated because there are things that you can do with young people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder the other thing that we want to see is once that has any kind of assessment been made a really intensive treatment for these young people. And so that's looking at mental health issues, any substance abuse issues for them or their family members, working with their family on how to operate as a family. So that might be coming into the family and helping out if there if there is a, a family unit, helping out with how to how to budget, how to do shopping, how to do cooking. We had another young boy who was a 15 year old boy and he came from a, a home that would have been classed as a middle class home, but the parents were had, were busy and, and always out and he had fallen into drug dealing and, and smoking marijuana and he didn't know to cook, how to cook a meal. So our youth worker worked with him, took him to the shops, showed him how to do a sort of uh, do a grocery list up, buy the groceries, go home and he went home with him and he cooked the steak and this kid felt so happy that he had done that. So these steps show what can be achieved with this kind of intensive work one-on-one -on -one with, with these children. We also want to see that once there has been the assessment, trying to make sure that there's a path back into education or training or gaining some sorts of skills. So, and you'll hear from Debbie about the youth detention centres. They talk about them being therapeutic, but I went out to the West Morton Detention Centre recently, and it's the one that's billed as the therape therapeutic centre that focuses on rehabilitation. And from hearing the Department of Youth Justice talk about it, I had pictures in my mind of nice lawns and shady trees where people could sit and chat underneath, but it's a prison. You go out, You've got to go through all the detectors. You've got to take a long time to be taken. You can't have your mobile phone. You can't take anything in there. From each section to each section, you have to stop. The person has to close the door behind you. You've got to wait. They can't open the door in front of the door behind's closed. 
Kids are in um, rooms that have heavily reinforced glass, small groups of kids, but with a carer sitting while there's a teacher teaching them. And they are getting lessons, but they're in really refined and constrained conditions. And there was nothing about it that struck me as being therapeutic, therapeutic or rehabilitative in that environment. It was just really depressing. The other um, matter that we see a lot at the Youth Advocacy Centre is kids that don't understand anything to do with their legal rights and obligations, and they find themselves in these paths, particularly now with the breach of bail law that has come in. So previously, magistrates would order, would make orders for young people's bail conditions to include quite therapeutic um, orders, such as you must attend um, substance abuse treatment at this day, you must go to school on these days, you must visit this person this day. So, so quite a set out regime. But now, because it's go, it's a it's a crime or an offence to breach bail, the magistrates aren't ordering that as much. So now that they they've stripped back what could be helpful bail conditions to just you must report to the police station at this date or that date. So it's it's having that kind of profound effect where you could be helping the young people back on the track to not being able to do that. Once the young people exit the detention centres, there is also a massive gap in picking them up and putting them on the right path. There are there's services for the first 72 hours, but 72 hours is nothing. There is a lot of time where young people have to figure out their housing, their, um, how they earn income, how they feed themselves. And there's a real lack of any kind of support at that pivotal moment. They go back, in a lot of cases, to the peer group that they were in, the peer group that they may have, that may be, to be a part of that group requires you to steal a car. We had, there were a number of YAC clients recently involved in an event where they um, stole, a, uh, stole a car and they had been awake for three or four days, high on meth. They couldn't even say what color it was of the, the car that they had stolen. They had no idea where they are, or what they were doing. There is no rational thought at that point in time when you have a young person who might have been brought up in difficult circumstances, might have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, little ed education, little family home life. Their family is the group of young people that they're hanging out with and that's the activity that they do. There is not going to be any rational thought about the consequences of that action. So the increased sentences which have been brought into effect in March have no impact on that behaviour. And that's the behaviour that the community wants addressed. The way that we address that behaviour is to address it when the child is young, when they are either born or the first signs of difficulty in school, assess them for mental health problems, substance abuse problems, trying to get them into a family situation that's functional and working with them and not stop and make sure that that intensive work doesn't stop until the child is on a path. The residential care model doesn't work. Many of the young people that have been involved in the crimes that have been in the media have come from residential care and it's an awful model. So children as young as 13 are in homes where each child might have a room and a youth worker comes in at different shifts and is just there supervising. It's not a loving family home and they're not being brought up by anybody. So the residential care model, which has a very high number of children in foster care end up in residential care because there aren't primary carers, ends up creating a culture amongst these young people of hopelessness, of nowhere to go, that there's no people that they can count on in their lives. There's no one that unconditionally loves them. So when you have a 13 year old in residential care, looked after by a youth worker on shift work, you're only going to end up with trouble. It's a really complicated social situation that's going on and it needs to be addressed at its very roots. If it's not addressed there, then we need to look at Keith's model and need to look at how to get kids that are in detention rehabilitated properly and not just with the token efforts that is that are going on at the moment. And just one final point I'll make before I hand over to Debbie. When the um, detention centres talk about the rehabilitation and the therapeutic impact in the detention centres, that's only possible, if at all, 
when they're properly staffed and the detention centres have not been properly staffed for a very long time. Nobody wants to do the job and so they're short staffed and often on what they call night mode, which is a euphemism for lockdown. And then the kids are just in their cells for long periods of time and not let out into the into the um, common area. Because the detention centres are overflowing, there's been the overflow into the watch house that we're all familiar with. The watch houses around Queensland vary from horrific to bearable, but they're adult watch houses that do not have do not have facilities for children. One of our clients was in the Maroochydore Door Watch House for 33 days, did not see daylight for that time. He was in by himself. His bed was the bench with a sort of a thickish yoga mat. He used that for his pillows and he had a paper blanket. It's just awful. So I hope that um, tonight we can have a discussion and, and have people thinking about how we can improve this situation because it cannot continue. Thank you. Well, since I can't, since I can't read my notes, I'll, I'll just to say, does Debbie Kilry need an introduction? She is one of the most right. important advocates for social justice in this state for about the last 40 years. After you, Debbie. Oh my God, oh my God, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks everyone. I did write some words down. I've just arrived back from Columbia, so I'm a bit um, jet lagged. Um, so I need to stay on track because I could go down rabbit holes. Um, yeah. So as is proper way, as a settler and uninvited guest on these lands, I acknowledge that I stand here today on unceded territories of the Turrbal and Yagara people here on the Anjan. I acknowledge the lands that each of you are zooming in on because we're online also. And no matter where we stand on this island continent, this is stolen land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I want to also acknowledge all the children sitting in cells right now, children who are being held captive by the colonial castle system, which exacts punishment with both cruelty and impunity. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Queensland um, Council of Civil Liberties for inviting me to speak here tonight, so thank you. I don't know if anybody else saw this today, but this was the front page of the Western Australian. Can people see that? I'm going to pass it around. This is how we are treating children. Police with guns to their heads. That's where we're at now. Police holding guns to children's heads. And we had Katarina Carroll, the Commissioner of Queensland Police Service say just a day or two ago, that someone is going to die, someone is going to be killed. And that's correct. A child is going to be killed. And it's lucky that that child wasn't killed yesterday. The flags are already up, the vigilantes are on the loose. And this government on both sides has lost control because they don't know how to care about children because they actually don't care about children. So uh, um, I was one of these teenagers, one of these children, when the cops showed up at my house when I was 13 and told me I had to go with them. I was dressed in my school uniform on that day because I was told I had to go to school. I hated school, school didn't engage me, I used to run away from school, I wagged school. So then the newly formed Juvenile Aid Bureau by the police had engaged social workers and decided to come into my home and convinced my parents to take me away when I was dressed in my uniform that morning to go to school. So, you know, authorities didn't make much sense to me, still don't really, um, in regards to I was dressed in my school uniform, told to go to school, but this day the adults showed up, the police, the social workers, and said, no, I'm not going to school today, I'm going with them. And where they took me was Wilson Youth Hospital um, over there at Wilson, the old children's prison that's been demolished now. So um, I was 13 and on my first day in a children's prison, I was wearing a school uniform. I was placed in a cage, only been here on this land for 13 years. I was a child, just a kid, and I was locked away from anyone who cared about me at all. In this country, we lock children up as young as 10 years old in cages, 10 year old. 10 year old children can be arrested, charged, dragged before a court and imprisoned and placed in cages, 
and watch houses which have already been described tonight. Children yesterday, and it's being passed around, had guns held against their heads as they protested about the violence being perpetrated against them in Banksia Children's Prison. The Aboriginal Legal Service in Western Australia had sent 59 complaints, 59 complaints to the government about those children in Banksia that were being physically assaulted, sexually abused, raped, harmed, traumatised and placed in solitary confinement. So what did they do? They protested, they got on the roof. Why do children get on the roof? To tell us that they are being harmed inside that prison. Not because they're terrorists, as they've been labelled on the front page of a paper, not because they're criminals, not because of any other language, derogatory language that they're called. It's because it's they're crying out for help. But we are told, because of the use of that derogatory language, that they mean nothing and they're the problem. We're actually, we're the problem because we're not hearing the cries for help. And we haven't heard the cries for help for decades and decades and decades before today and probably decades to come. And there will be a Royal Commission into what's actually happening, not in this state, in this country, to children in our prisons because of what's actually happening, the violence that's being perpetrated against them as individuals. And what will happen when there's a Royal Commission? Lots of lawyers will get rich. There'll be fancy, um, probably electronic, actually, um, you know, reports, not reports that are put on bookshelves and gathering dust anymore. But, you know, we keep doing the same thing. And as it said, the definition of a san insanity is doing the same thing. And that's what we're doing. So I, I want to encourage you to please hear these children's cries out for help. They're our children, our future. And the way that we treat children today is going to actually lay the journey of the treatment for us as we get older in life. And what sort of community do we really want to live in? I want to live in a community where there's no harm perpetrated against anybody and not make excuses for harm that the state inflicts. As Michael said earlier tonight, there's almost 800 children sitting in children's prisons across the country. Close to 600 of these kids are aged between 10 and 13 years. And thousands of more children are hauled before our courts every single year. More than 65% are, Torres, are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. In fact, um, Michael talked about um, the rate, and we know that First Nations children are jailed at a rate 17 times higher than non-Indigenous children, and that rate soars to 43 times higher in the Northern Territory. And in the Northern Territory, and even in um, uh, Northern Queensland, it can be nearly 100%, if not 100%. And when we talk about stats, I, I think um, people need to be aware. If we say, if I say, for example, that 70% of children in our youth prisons at this point of time, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, most people would assume the other 30% are white. They're not, they're children of colour. They're Polynesian children, they're African children. It is rare that you see a white child in a prison. It is rare. And if that there is, they are children who have been severely abused and impoverished and harmed with mental health issues that are also dumped in those cages with children of colour and Aboriginal children. I'm not going to go through the stats because uh, Michael's already done that. So you talk re recidivism, I talk recriminalisation. You know, evidence tells us that the younger a child is, a younger, the younger a child is the first time they're sentenced, the more likely they're to be recriminalised and end up in an adult prison before their 22nd birthday. The Sentencing Advisory Council here um, did some research and 94% of children in prison aged between 10 and 12 were returned to prison before they were 18. So once you start locking children up, they're on this, this cycle that they can't get off. So the trajectory outcomes for children forced into contact with the criminal punish, punishment system are dire. Imprisoned children are less likely to complete their education or find employment and are more likely to die an early death. Australia's youth detention centre system represents a gross false economy. It costs about $531,075 a year to keep one child 
in a detention-based supervision system over half a million dollars a year to imprison a single child. Just think about that for a minute, half a million dollars to a year to imprison a child. I have arguments all the time with bureaucrats and say, give the family the half a million dollars a year. And they go, oh my God, they would waste the money. It's like, oh my God, we're wasting it anyway. Like, hello, give the family, but th that's the fear, right? We don't want these families, these Aboriginal families, these poor families to be middle class, white like us. Where do we want them? We want in cages. We have to address our DNA in our own system. This was a penal colony. This is how this country started from the invasion and colonisation, and we still carry that and we can't see outside the bars within our own internal system of where we come from. And it's time we've got to break open the bars and stop locking up children. You know, it's a mass, it's mass, a mass imprisonment crisis that we have with our children. It's a national shame, you know, that we can as a society protect our children, support and nurture our children, all children. I'm not talking about your little individual children or grandchildren at home or anybody else's. I'm talking about every child. Every child is our future. Every child deserves a future, a future that we've all had. Maybe not what I had, but you know, other people in the room. But I mean, it's about how do we protect our children? That's how we build a better community, a better society, not by harming them, torturing them, abusing them, allowing the state to ensure that they are violated sexually, physically, emotionally in cages. We as the adults have a responsibility to say no more. You know, in an address we talk about from Mouths of Babes, right? In his address to the United Nations Rights Council in Geneva back in 2019, an Aradaran uh, Garawa boy, Juan Hussain, he was 12 years old and he said, I want adults to stop crueling 10 year old kids and children. A simple and poignant message for all of us and out of the mouths of babes. Add to that the collective anguish about Aboriginal children trapped in the child punishment system is expressed in the Illaroo statement from the heart with the words, proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alienated from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them and our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for our future. This system of justice and so-called correction kills. And the reality is, as it currently stands, our colonial laws isolate, punish and harm some of our community's most vulnerable and stigmatised children. The system we are told to design and protect sows the seeds of future problems. And for First Nations communities, the same system <coughs> takes lives. I remember Christopher Drage and Tris Jack Simpson, who were only 16 and 17 years old when they drowned the Swan River after a police chase in 2018. I remember GJ Rowe, who was killed in custody in 1997 at 11 years old. I remember GWR, who was killed in custody in 2013, and he was 15 years old. We should all remember people. We remember young Patty, or known as P, in her coronial inquiry. 13 year old girl who killed in custody. She'd been involved in the so-called child protection system, which I call the family policing system, since she was born and had been in 14, 14 separate out of home care placements since she was two. KS, who was 13 years old when her life was taken. The coroner in her case asked the police to reflect on its justifications for conducting police pursuits by saying, quote, is a stolen motor vehicle without any other known risk factors worth a life, end quote. And I remember the 15 kids who were killed in custody between 1989 and 1996. Five of those deaths were in carceral spaces, four died in adult prisons, one died after escaping from a juvenile detention centre. Ten Aboriginal kids were killed during police pursuits. Nine died following police car chases and one Aboriginal child was shot and killed by police. I tell you this and name these children because we should all be thinking and should always remember them. And there will be more to come if we keep doing the same. We should know all their names and we should know the names of every child that's killed 
in this system we call morality and justice because this is all of yours, my responsibility, because every one of these children was killed by a system designed to keep people like you and you safe, you and me safe, from people like me and children that are being targeted today by the state and the police. I remember every single child who has climbed to the top of the prison building to protest their rights being violated. I remember that they had to fight for their rights while we were turning away. This photo that's getting passed around will be embedded in my mind forever after. A gun, a tactical response, police officers on the roof holding guns to Aboriginal children's heads. It's just mind blowing. I, I really don't have words that can explain how the grief and the anger that is caught up in all that photo. You know, the violence that's perpetrated goes on and on and as my own experience as a child as a 13 year old and the violence is perpetrated now we have strip searching we had strip searching back then but it was about how we as children and i remember the reaction that we had to push back on the violence as perpetrated as us as girls at wilson youth hospital was called so now we've got therapeutic prisons announced today the one i was in called a hospital We've had reformatories and dormitories and every other name you can call it. But if you can't walk out the door, it's a prison. That's it. A prison is a prison and a prison. And the way that we push back about what happened to us, because we used to have to go to the gynecologist. So a gynecologist was employed by the prison and we would have to go to the gynecologist every week to be checked by the gynecologist with his ducks bill to make sure that we were virgins and clean before we were allowed to swim in their pool. The way that we pushed back was not to get on the roof, but to jump the fence and jump in the pool and refuse to get out. That was our protest. No one asked us why we were doing that. We were deemed bad because we jumped in the pool and refused to get out. So of course, um, back them days, they were nurses and orderlies because it was called a hospital, but same thing, screws are screw surrounded us and waited until we were cold at night and had their dogs and all the rest of it to get us out of the pool. And the gynecologist continues on with his sexual assault that was actually, you know, approved by the state. And here we are, 50 years, nearly, not quite 50, nearly 50 years on, and we do the same thing to children now by strip searching them um, and humiliating them and bashing them and raping them and harming them and locking them in solitary confinement, holding them in watch houses nonstop with no daylight. Um, when does it end? They are violent places, violent places. So that's why I also don't support the Raise the Age campaign. You know, raise the age, raise it to 14. I'm an abolitionist <laughs> and I'm not happy to campaign for any child or anybody actually to be exiled to a cage where they are tortured and tormented. We can argue that a child at 10 should not be um, criminally responsible for his or her actions, but are we then comfortable saying a 14 year old is? I think we've got to hold the line. We've got to hold the line and protect our children. Children don't belong in prisons. Children don't belong in cages. Children should never be harmed. There's no moral justification for spending close to half a million or more than half a million dollars a year per child on a system that clearly does not work. Um, you know, if I was um, running a private business and ran at a loss, I would be questioning what I'm doing. But we never question the state about their failures around the whole criminal so-called justice system, criminal legal system. We keep giving them more and more money, whether it's cops, courts or prisons or the family policing system who, where it starts by the removal of a baby and we just have seen this in the last couple of days an Aboriginal woman who is pregnant in a Darwin prison has been they went to court corrections and health to uh, get an order to induce that baby because the mothers and babies unit no longer exists because of the overcrowding and women are using um, the area so they decided to go to court and get an order to induce the baby. I paid lawyers in the territory to go and represent her to do a bail application this week. 
um, which they did yesterday in the lower court, and they she was granted bail. Prosecutions went immediately to the Supreme Court to appeal that decision, so she wasn't released. Um, and this is so that she could be released to have her baby in the free world. The Supreme Court sat on that yesterday afternoon at two o'clock, uh, took evidence, adjourned it till today, uh, and ordered that the solicitor of the Northern Territory come and give evidence on behalf of Corrections and Health uh, as to if he was not to grant her bail, what would happen to her and the baby. However, what happened by this afternoon, their strategy, and see, this is a game. This is a game for lawyers. It was never about the mother and the baby. What they did is showed up in the Supreme Court, served papers, the family policing system, to take the baby. So a whole other area of law and said, we're not going to induce the baby anymore. So the bail application was refused about quarter to six tonight um, when I was on my way here. And now the woman has to uh, front up in court, probably have no lawyers, but we'll organise lawyers in regards to a, you know, a child protection matter because that's how they're going to remove the baby now. Um, so this game that lawyers play in courts actually damages um, people's lives and generations to come because they knew they weren't going to win the argument for the bail application. So they did it, uh, undertook another strategy to be smarter than everybody else. And at no time was that mother or that unborn child ever a part of that consideration where they could have agreed to allow her to come out of prison and give birth to her baby in the free world where it was not taken by family policing, another black child, another Aboriginal child removed. What they did is fought the lawyers, white lawyers, white middle upper class lawyers who think they're privileged and know better than everybody else. And yes, they pissed me off, if you can't tell. <laughs> I suppose, you know, Keith and I have known, I've known Keith probably half my life because I was in Bogger Road when Keith was the Director General of corrective services and then um, it was when uh, Wayne Goss was elected in October 1989 or November or something and there was a window of reform there um, and um, Keith always has ideas he's an ideas man and um, he was a forward think more forward thinker back in them days well I'm not saying not a forward thinker these days but you know what I mean? But th thought about things and set up these committees for us women in prison. And most of the women that I was in prison with in Bogger Road were the girls that I was in the kids' prison with. And it was a, what, in hindsight, when I look back, it was a window of reform here, and the only window of reform in this jurisdiction um, between about 89 and 92, where education was the priority. And many of us, um, you know, took up those opportunities. It was after a murder. A murder of my friend sitting beside me in prison. Um, Keith and um, others cleared out the management level who were horrific at Bogger Road, the women's prison, and put in people in who actually believed in education um, and actually treated us with dignity and respect. And how that made such a huge difference in our lives to be able to engage in education. So I started my Bachelor of Social Work degree in prison and um, I was allowed to go out to university, UQ, to start my um, education. But also committees were set up where we actually had a say about the running of the prison. And so we learnt very quickly how to think around corners and back doors to argue and negotiate with the general manager of the time, um, which taught us skills, that skills that I still have today. Um, and so, you know, being someone who's a prisoner and, and Keith was the director general, we had ideas and your door was always open. I remember when I was out on parole, I used to come up, you know, to your floor and walk straight in your door. You can't do that anymore because there's locks on everywhere. Like we've, you know, this whole security and this fear of others instead of being able to have a conversation with others um, about what's actually going on. And so I think that there's ideas that we can move forward for all our children, particularly the children that are being criminalised and imprisoned and harmed, um, to move forward. But the reality is that this government is not interested. This government is about, it's about politics, it's about marketing, it's about who's going to win the election next year. 
And th there's other things that can happen before the model of Keith's as well. So I just want to say that, like, you know, we had a, we had, um, when John Howard was the Prime Minister, he actually funded some one-off projects around the country. And one of them was a project that um, still to this day it works. And that's where we support families in, in absolute whole in their homes. So get them a home. And so um, we had three women and their families that we supported over a 18 month period quite intensely. The first six months is where we were in their house every day. So arrive in the morning, get the kids up, make breakfast with mum, get them dressed, get them to school, you know, make their lunches, do some things with mum through the day, do the washing, the cleaning, whatever had to happen, pick the kids up, take them to the park, come back, cook dinner, put them to bed and go home and do it again and again and again and again. Those three families today got all their kids back from the family policing system. The teenage kids who are in resi care got them back into their own care and they have never been in trouble, have never been criminalised and never have been in prison. One mum did die, but her two daughters are doing very well and they've been never, never been criminalised. But those three families, other than Tash who died, um, have never been on a, another state order again in their lives. There's things out there that we do as organisations that actually work. And um, I think we talked about some model somewhere. But the other the other place that's doing something that's very interesting is Hawaii. I was there last year. So they're closing the only children's prison. And that's an American state, right? But it's Aboriginal people who are driving the agenda. They are using and they have legislated trauma informed care in every aspect of a child's life. Not just saying today what I'm doing like they do here, child safety and youth justice. We're, we're operating this framework. Today we're operating trauma informed and they're doing exactly the same thing, right? They just give it a different label. They're actually doing it in Hawaii where there's been no girls in their kids prison for 18 months now and there's about, they've got it down to about 12 boys and it's actually working and they're working to the point where um, they will shut the prison that they have and there'll be no child in their prison. So there's things that actually work and at Sisters Inside, the Yanga program, which is funded by the state, um, which is a bail program. We support the girls in southeast Queensland and have a very good success rate. So, it, you know, that whole program's run by um, Aboriginal women who support predominantly the Aboriginal girls and other girls, but it's a trauma informed cultural healing care model. So where the girls are taken over to Minjerabar and do healing there, and the majority of them have never been recriminalised and they have not been put back into the youth prison. So there's actually programs and support that's working here in the community, but these are the things that the government do, do not want to fund. We have lobbied this government to expand our Yanga program to North Queensland. They rang me up the other day and said, oh, we have no money, Debbie. We're sorry, we can't do that. But they found money to build two new prisons that they announced today. So thank you. Um, thank you very much. So we have some time, I, I think, for some questions from the audience. So if somebody has some questions, I'm sure our speakers would like to uh, answer the questions. Thanks for the comments you've made. I know I've been my life. I can have put a lot of value on the ones that I've reserved from the criminal justice system. <laughs> Bye. Uh, good value for money. <laughs> well, it is considering the cost of a jail. Do you change? You're dreaming. I'm truly think you're dreaming, aren't you? We get joint government agreement on policy for your program. I mean, the Liberals are worse than the other mob. The other mob have just gone the other way. You're pushing against the back and die, mate. Sorry, Keith, maybe because we only have one mic, so if you would like to come up here. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but it can be done. And I said back in 88, and Debbie referred to uh, the time that she was there. Uh, we did have for a couple of years bipartisan support for the reform program that Kennedy mapped out. Uh, at the moment, uh, it's just political games at the level and it's going to be very hard to do it. It'd be lovely to get the leaders of 
the, t the major parties in the room and hear the sort of thing that Debbie and Catherine just spoke about and make them get it through their head that we've just got to stop this nonsense and we don't put ch children in concrete cells. We do so many other options. They've all, Debbie and Catherine have touched on things that can be done and it has to, we have to empower local communities to, to work together with professionals like Debbie and Catherine and others to build these sort of community-based responses. Um, Can it be done without government policy? Just what, you know, like Deb's program, which is got funding for the bail program. Mm. Can it be done without government? Can't be done without government in my view. I'd like to know what Debbie thought of that, but. It can be. <laughs> It can be because, but we need we need money to do that to employ yeah. staff. So we need philanthropic. That's right. And so, um, but we don't have big philanthropic organisations. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, you yeah. can yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's the reality, right? So here, like, it's interesting in the US, anyone that's doing any of this type of work is funded through philanthropy. Here, it's government. So they're like, oh my God, you get money from the government. And we're like, oh my God, you get money from philanthropists. But, you know, I've got the opportunity. I'm going to New York next week and pitching to a number of philanthropic organisations who are interested in funding stuff in Australia. Um, and hopefully, because then we get to do, do what we want, what we know is going to work um, and be funded by, you know, philanthropists in the US. You know, we had, we, uh, I pitched a model to um, this government when Jackie Trab was the treasurer and they set up a big meeting with all the heads of the um, departments, including the police, because part, part of the key model, uh, key part of this model was the police. And it was a women and girls center where, so Sisters Inside is in watch houses, is in courts, is in prisons, is everywhere to, you know, decarcerate to get girls out, women out and keep them out or, or they don't go in. The piece that was missing is stopping women being arrested in the first instance. So the Women and Girls Centre is a framework where um, the police, if they arrest Mary down the street, they bring Mary to us. They don't take her to the watch house, they don't charge her, right? And then we can sort out all the social issues. Now, did a massive pitch with all of them, it was on side. It was about to be signed. I was actually in New York, um, March 2020, and I had a phone call from Treasury to say that they were funding it. And I said, well, I'm in New York. I'll be back next week. That's OK. You and the Treasurer can sign it next week and make the announcement. Great. But what happened? COVID. Bang. You know, um, I landed on the 14th of March, one of the first ones to have COVID. And that just, Jackie Trav was gone. Everything was gone. It was never funded. The police were on side they were actually going to be bringing women to us and not to the watch house. So, um, but it's not a model that they're interested in any longer um, because they do this whole, the, the model that they're funding is this co-responder, co-responder for kids, co-responder for DV, which is just about the state moving money across departments, which isn't probably real money, but employing bureaucrats with more cops, youth justice, you know, um, people working in the DV sector. but by the state. So they're not interested in funding the community, the community solutions. And, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time in the last seven, eight months in Cairns with community up there about to talk about reimagining their community because Palaszczuk announced in, uh, I think it was the 5th of October last year, building a prison up there, $500 million. So we've been working with that community up there about how they could reimagine their community and use that money instead of a prison. They don't want a prison, but now they've got the announcement up there. They had the announcement then, but then, you know, they've been pushing it and throwing around hundreds of millions of dollars while they've been up there this week. Um, we don't have that clout and people become silenced in the sector because they, they have been threatened as well. We know that ministers have been up there to NGOs saying that if you speak out against the prison and youth justice, you're not getting funded anymore. So they're doing exactly the thing that LMP did and why they got lost the election and that was threatening people to be silent um, and even threatening judicial officers, right? Stephen Miles, go yeah. figure. Yeah. 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 Putting a submission to the World Economic Forum to see if there's philanthropic groups um, through Europe that could possibly receive funding. The World Economic Forum. Yeah. 
you've already had a comment. Um, do you wish to make a comment, Michelle? Um, this is, I guess, a two-part question for all the speakers. Are there avenues that people who might like to directly volunteer can go through? And if so, if possible, press links maybe via the Christmas Scale website. Yeah, on our website, there's a link there that you can go to. Resources inside website? Yes, inside website. Yeah. And I guess for that, I'll just read this as well. Catherine? Uh, I think we've got one on the website, but otherwise, if not, I can be touched with Michael. Uh, gentleman down the back. Um, just a couple of things. Keith, is this some slide presentation available for people to be able to? Have a copy of? Yeah, sure. How do they get it? Um, well, you, you can send it to me, and if you go to the QC, well, well exactly. Exactly. You, you, you you can email, go to the QCCL website and email us. Okay. I'm happy to send it to you. Well, I'm I'm yeah, yeah. That's right. I've also, just on the disadvantage, just like to point out in the last few days, the 10 local government association areas in Australia that are the lowest on every met metric. Six of them are First Nation communities in Queensland. Wurrabinda, Wajal Wajal, Yarrabah, Sherberg, Wurrabinda. There's another one I can't remember. And the other four are First Nation communities in the Northern Territory. I'd also just like to ask the inability of the catatonic state that the state government is in. I'm just wondering about what unions might be influencing their fear. Would you like to comment on on that? Definitely. Yeah, Definitely the police union, but um, Ian Levers has, I think there's one thing that he has said that we can all agree on, and that's early intervention. So that's one common ground with the police union, but the police union is extremely powerful in this circumstance and is not helping dampen down the hysteria around youth justice issues. Um, and also the union of the prison workers. Is it? Is that? They, I think they know more about that than me, but yeah, the police union, definitely. Um, any, uh, Roger? I think if you talk, well, she's talking to the conversion already, or at least with the regional council for civil liberties. And uh, I was struck by something that somebody else was saying to Keith about the extreme difficulty of contemplating a uh, a joint <clears throat> view from the two parties in the Queensland Parliament. Because obviously what they're doing is they're, they're all frightened that they're going to lose the election if they don't look after law and order. It's not rational things that you've been talking about, the law and order. But why is that? It's because we of course, the public have become besotted with the idea that we have to be protected from harm at all costs. It's come to the floor in the federal sphere that people coming into the country and maybe they could be terrorists or God knows what. It's in the floor here because you think about kids at school. Can they walk down the street? No, it's too dangerous. You've got to get in a four wheel drive someplace or be driven around to the danger of other people. But they are all right. And that whole thing pervades the public. How can you, how can we get to the public and say, take a risk if necessary? just to enjoy the fact that kids, so we'll go wrong, but if you can get the net benefit 
that's what we want. And what you touched on there is the fact that if you look at the debate that's going on in the media and at the political level about law and order, it's very emotional. It's driven by fear and it's not driven by science or evidence. The and this was addressed by the Queensland Productivity Commission in 2019 when they asked or recommended that we have a justice reform office. And that, if you go back to Northern Europe, where somebody mentioned the Swedish situation about the very small number of people in prison and right across that Northern Europe situation, way back, they set about putting evidence-based information into the public arena. And that's what this justice reform office would do. It would report to Parliament and it would give real evidence, the sort of things that you heard Debbie and Catherine talk about being put up and saying, you can't treat this by jailing people and putting up proper solutions. At the moment, we haven't got an evidence-based debate. I mean, politicians wouldn't go into the operating theatre and start telling surgeons how to do operations and things, but they don't regard criminology and social issues as hard science. They don't take any notice of the evidence and the statistics and the human face of that. And so, in, and the government has never been prepared to move on that justice reform office. And we do need a parliamentary committee that that office reports to, in my view, and that information needs to go to parliament. And we need to have our media, our media being properly informed about the statistics, the information you've heard uh, Debbie and Catherine talk about. And so that then people, and when you talk, I've talked to so many community groups, once they hear the evidence and people say, let's do it. But at the moment, all you get is headlines in the Curie Mail and the sort of thing that that poster going around the moment with guns at kids' heads. How could any civilised society think that that's the way to go? <clears throat> I don't have any more questions over here? No? Okay, well, I think we might uh, call it uh, quits there. Thank you very much.